Hello and welcome. Thank you for taking the time to participate in part four of our Climate and Community Faithful Action for Climate Justice Called Seminar Series. This webinar will be looking at the many ways Indigenous communities are leading in the climate justice movement and have been working to ensure water justice. For accessibility purposes, I will share a physical description of myself. I'm Mexican American with dark brown hair and eyes. My hair is around shoulder length. I'm sitting in my office and you can see a bookshelf and plants in the background. My name is Reverend Katie Monforte and I'm the education program coordinator at Church and Society. I'm glad to be facilitating this webinar with my colleague, our Senior Executive Director of Education and Engagement, Amy Hong. I'll take a minute to give a brief outline of our time together. We'll begin by sharing a video which features young people who were at COP26. They are part of the global community, Creation Justice for All, which enables the Methodist family to uh, take climate action together. Next, we will introduce our speaker, unpacking her work and the grounding for her call to environmental and climate justice work as a water protector. We will then continue the conversation with questions from you all. So Amy will be leading our question and answer segment. Be sure to populate your questions while Dr. Leonard presents to us. We will close with announcements. As we will prepare to plan, as we prepare to play today's video, I want to give thanks to the staff and young people who shared their conviction and passion for climate justice. We thank you young people for constantly pushing urgency and action to address the current climate crisis. My name is Jessica Wali. From Zambia, I'm a climate activist and I'm a journalist by profession. I'm a Telecop 26 as uh, the African ambassador for the climate justice for all and uh, the Methodist in Britain. And I feel so privileged to actually be able to attend the COP26 because this is my first COP26. And also just to be in a place with people that uh, I uh, really want to see the best for the environment because I am so passionate, I'm a very passionate climate activist actually, simply because I think I've seen uh, how the effects of uh, climate change has on people, uh, especially in my country. I've seen how it has negatively affected a lot of people. And that is why I've been trying by all means to get to learn more, get more information, be educated about it and get to learn more so that I can then just um, give the information back to the people that um, may actually need it. So this to me is very close to my heart 
and I think when it comes to also climate uh, issues, uh, there's one uh, particular cycle or particular um, point that is really close to my heart, and that is climate change, uh, climate gender, because it's a topic really close to my heart. I think it is one of the topics that has even made me to be so passionate about being a climate activist because I understand how women and the young children have been affected when it comes to climate crisis. So my being here, I really hope that uh, I definitely will be able to get a lot of information, get to uh, create rapports and also just get to be connected with a lot of people with like-minded, uh, that are like-minded um, like me and also uh, just to get share notes so that I can then use that information not just for me but also for my home uh, back in Zambia. So it's been an amazing uh, journey to actually get to be here. Uh, being on the Climate Justice for All project. So finally being here, it really means a lot. So I'm really looking forward to more activism. Uh, it doesn't end just after call. You know, the fight has to go on. So Climate Justice for All. Thank you. <laughs>
We are a tribal nation located on the east end of Long Island in what's currently known as New York. So you can see here on the map, this is uh, the eastern portion of Long Island or what is also known as Suffolk County. Uh, this is the traditional territory of my nation, of the Shinnecock Nation. Um, and But what you can see here in purple is our existing territory that due to colonization um, and land uh, stealings is now sort of diminished. Um, but we have uh, a portion of our territory that we still um, maintain and live on, known as the Shinnecock Neck. It's a peninsula that juts out into Shinnecock Bay with the uh, barrier island on the other opposite end and the Atlantic Ocean on the other side of that barrier island. So we are very much water people, coastal people. Uh, Shinnecock in our language means people of the stony shore. So I often uh, say that a big impetus for me becoming a water scientist was, was and is my identity as a Shinnecock woman and being a shore protector. Um, and so some of the imagery that you can see here below as well as indicative of our cultural background as Shinnecock people, we are fishers, we are bay people, we are people of the sea. We are well known for harvesting of mollusk relatives, including quahogs and whelk, um, many of which we then uh, carve. We, we, we use all parts of um, our animal relatives. And so we usually will then carve those uh, mollusk relatives into what you may know today as wampum beads or different types of wampum carvings. Um, and these being sort of these purple and white beads that are also um, very historically and contemporarily important to how we understand water governance in what's currently known as North America, because many of the first transboundary water treaties were treaties formed uh, and constituted by wampum belts and really bringing into formation um, physically through material culture, the connection between ocean and, and freshwater systems and really recognizing that uh, it's all connected in the hydrologic system and that water connects us all in, in, on this planet and, and to one another. And so when we uh, look further into some of the work that I do now and what I want to share with you today, I'm based in Ontario, Canada, zooming in from Haudenosaunee and Anishinaabek territories in southwestern Ontario. And so as you can see here, this is an image of the Great Lakes and the Great Lakes Basin, where a portion of my research is uh, centered and concentrated. And so I want to share with you today a little bit of the work that I have done in amplifying uh, the work of others, really, and, and amplifying the work of what I like to call grassroots grandmothers, our sort of silent protectors of water and earth and planetary health. And before we get into that, though, I wanted to just highlight a question for you. And that question is really to say uh, and ask of you, what is water? Uh, some folks may be familiar with this question. I have a little bit of, uh, I guess, notoriety out in the world due to a TED Talk. Um, but if you haven't seen a TED Talk, let's just engage. What is water? You're welcome to uh, type your answers into the chat box, and I will read them out loud. So we've got some wonderful answers coming in. The basis of all life, H2O, uh, water is life, hydrogen and oxygen, lots of life, life. Good emphasis there. Mini Wachoni, yeah, water is life. Very good. Life sustaining, the great connector. Essential to survival, salvation. What makes Earth special in the universe? I love that. That's a that's a, a unique one. We baptize with water. Uh, H2O, basic life, habitat for many people and wildlife. Really great. And then uh, the Earth's blood. I think uh, that's a really interesting one as well. So sometimes when I ask this question, particularly in different spaces and communities, the answers are always different. And I love that. I think it shows us the way in which our value systems shape how we interact with water, why we interact with water, uh, and how we come to understand that relationship 
to or with water. But generally, when I ask this question, in the spaces of folks who make decisions about how water should be protected and managed and the types of conservation and environmental decision-making that occurs around water, we more predominantly focus, or folks will more predominantly focus on the chemical and biological characteristics of water, H2O, as was mentioned earlier by others, um, habitat support, uh, the aspects of water in, in sort of biophysical determinations, um, physical manifestations, whether that be liquid, gas, um, ice, uh, rivers, lakes, ocean, etc. cetera. Um, and all of that is true. But in the work that I do, I found that there was a disconnect in the types of questions we ask about water. And it often always came back to this sort of preeminent question that's asked in environmental decision-making of what is water or what water are we talking about? Really positioning water as an object. But if we actually take a look at how some other traditions in the world, maybe outside of the dominant water regime, which might be framed within a Western or um, Enlightenment uh, period of understanding in, in terms of sort of, again, sort of Western philosophical framing of relations to water, if we asked what, how other traditions, how other philosophical traditions around the world might view water, they often don't ask what is water, but who is water? And if we started to ask different questions in our environmental management and decision-making, like who is water? Who is the water that we're concerned with in the context of this environmental plan? Who is the water that we uh, are wanting to preserve? It fundamentally shifts and transforms our approach to water. It really starts to recognize that the water itself is a living entity has rights therein that should be protected. And it starts to transform our thinking away from viewing water solely as a resource or a commodity that provides services and benefits to humans and humans alone, but rather starts to position our understanding of water as another living entity to whom we have a responsibility and duty of stewardship and care and relationality because for lack of better words, we're, we're all in this together. We're in this with the water. Um, and, and fundamentally too, if we start to ask these different types of questions, we also come to see that we have better environmental outcomes. If the water is healthy, we are healthy. And right now, the bar that we set for environmental management is fairly low. The bar to make sure that water is healthy for human consumption and human needs is very low. But if we set the bar to ask, what does the water need to be healthy and thriving? What do the other relatives and animal relations that rely on that water habitat to be healthy and thrive need? The bar slowly starts to raise. The health of the entirety of the ecosystem starts to be raised and be more brought and brought more into the consciousness of our decision-making processes. And that's really important as we think about the current state of our planet, the climate crisis that we're in. One of the greatest challenges to planetary health is loss of biodiversity. And the World Wildlife Fund in their 2020 report on biodiversity loss found that one of the most drastic declines in biodiversity was occurring in freshwater ecosystems. Now that can be received in a very sort of negative or hopeless state. And, and it is, a, it is a very hopeless statistic to receive, but I also find it's an opportunity. It's an opportunity for us as human beings, as a global society to say, if this is the area that the ecosystem that has had the most dramatic loss of biodiversity, it also has the greatest opportunity for regeneration, for restoration, for relationality to be burst and reconstituted and reaffirmed. And so that's what I do in a lot of the, the work in my science and research is to think about the ways in which we can learn from the natural world, 
learn from freshwater ecosystems how to be better stewards and how to help nature do what it already excels at, which is to regenerate and thrive. Um, but for human interference, uh, nature would be doing really well without all of us. Um, so that, that's what I wanted to share with you today. And I wanna share more about how some individuals and communities are working to embed that message in conservation practice across the Great Lakes. So the art I want, I'm showing you here is artwork done by uh, Métis artist Christy Bellacour, um, really highlighting that anyone on this planet can be a water protector. They can and really should be working to restore their connection to water. And from an indigenous epistemology and recognizing that indigenous peoples are, we're, we're not a monolith. There are many diverse nations across uh, the continent and then across the world, but there is a common theme around water and an acknowledgement from the work that I've done in the Great Lakes that water is our first medicine. And what do we mean by that when that phrase is said? Well, from the grassroots grandmothers, as I mentioned, that I spoke with, many of them highlighted that water is our first medicine because we are nurtured in the womb in by water for nine months, or maybe a little more, a little less, give or take, depending on your birth story. But with that, that water constitutes our first natal connection. Uh, and so one grandmother, a Nishinaabe grandmother, always said in my conversations with her that we are all, every human being on this planet is born with a natal connection to water. And our responsibility is to steward that connection throughout the entirety of our lives and to pass that on to future generations. Because in stewarding that connection, in recognizing that connection, we also acknowledge the great gift that we are given in being born onto this planet. And in that gift, we do not have an entitlement to water, to use it, to consume it, to commodify it, but rather we have a duty and a responsibility to care for water. And in that relationship of stewardship and nurture and, and, and that relationship based in nurturing, the water will also give back to us, to sustain us, to ensure that we, as well as other living beings are able to continue our existence here. And so we know that given our current climate crisis, given the many environmental challenges that we face, these types of ideologies and transformative value, values of water are imperative to solving the planetary crises that we face. And so I wanted to share with you the words of one great mentor um, in this research and in this work, uh, the late Josephine Mandemanbaugh, who passed away a few years ago now. But she always said that we're all born of water. We're all connected with the water. We're all related in that way. Even though we're not related by blood, we're related by water. So water is very precious for us. And I, I also want to call your attention to something that former general, uh, former Secretary General Ban Ki-moon of the United Nations once said, that for the global challenges we are now facing, it requires global solidarity. And I find that water can be the greatest conduit to building these movements of solidarity because it connects us all, because it doesn't recognize these imagined borders or boundaries that we invent and socially construct as humans. But that in reality, in its physical manifestation, it is flowing and connecting and living across and through each of our communities. And so I wanna highlight now a bit of the work that's been done in this space. And so when I first um, met grandmother Josephine Ba, she told me, you know, I asked her about the work that she was doing at that time to protect water. And I asked her uh, how she came to be known as the water walker. And she said to me that in the early 2000s, um, through um, a spiritual community that she was a part of, she was called a prophecy. And that prophecy said that in the future, there would come a time where an ounce of water 
would cost more than an ounce of gold. And when I sort of first um, met Grandmother Josephine Baugh, it was probably about maybe five or six years ago now. And we were already, it seemed like we were already living in this time of prophecy where even in the past year with the massive amounts of droughts that we've seen in the Southwestern portions of the United States, the um, threats to water supply for mega cities like Vegas and Los Angeles, et cetera, the trading of water within the stock market and the future and the futures market, it really felt like we were already in a time where we were commodifying water to such an extent that this prophecy was now not something of the future, but of our existing reality. And so despite all of that, Grandmother Josephine Baugh was still very hopeful. And when she heard that prophecy, it wasn't just a prophecy of this sort of negative foreboding experience of water costing more than gold in the future. But every person that heard that prophecy was challenged at the end, what are you going to do about it? And so Grandmother Josephine Baugh uh, went back to um, her home at that time uh, in Thunder Bay on Lake Superior, and she met with other indigenous elders and grandmothers, and they sat together and they ultimately, after many discussions, uh, decided that they were going to walk for the water. They were going to have um, a water ceremony and be in prayer for the water. Um, and so the illustrations you're seeing here, I won't have time to fully go into the full story of the water walker, um, Josephine Meneman Ba and, and their story of the water walkers. But I encourage you to um, buy this book. Uh, it's called The Water Walker. It's by Joanne Robertson. Um, and it features sort of the life story of how this water walking came to be. And it's an ancient tradition but it's been sort of reconstituted and rematriated uh, through the work of, of Josephine Ba. And so when they were asked, what are they going to do about it? They said, you know, we're gonna walk in prayer and ceremony and we're gonna start in Lake Superior. And so in 2003, um, indigenous grandmothers and others came together and they walked um, Lake Superior, all of Lake Superior. And then they walked in 2004, Lake Michigan and Lake Huron in 2005. They walked, um, they walked uh, Lake Ontario in 2006, Lake Erie in 2007. Uh, they walked the St. Lawrence River in 2009 and there have been many more walks since then. But they also walked many of the lakes multiple times, um, all in prayer and ceremony for the health of the Great Lakes. And as you can see here, um, the, the variety of watersheds that are uh, included in the larger Great Lakes Basin. And so when I spoke with water walkers um, a few years back, there were two organizations that uh, were sort of leading the charge in, in water walking. Uh, Mother Earth Water Walkers, which was founded by Josephine Ba, and then Nibay Walks, um, which was founded by another grandmother um, named Sharon Day. She's uh, in her image is in the right um, top right hand corner here, as uh, along with other water walkers that were participating in a walk that um, they were leading at that time. But in addition to those two organizations, there have been many more organizations and communities that have banded together to host walks uh, throughout uh, and around the world uh, since the early 2000s. And in particular, um, in some research that I and other colleagues did, we found that there have actually been 120, more than 120 walks that have been held since 2003. Um, and that number was actually, that count was done in 2018. Um, and since then we've had probably about another um, 30 walks that have happened uh, since, since that count just a few years ago. So this constantly growing, and I think it's also a testament to the legacy of uh, Grandmother Josephine Ba, who um, has passed away, but water walking continues and her memory lives on. And often folks will ask, well, well what, what is water walking beyond sort of prayer and, and ceremony? And I ask that question to the water walkers and they say, it's for us, it's an opportunity to be like water. And I think what that means is too often as humans, we are focused 
more on what water can do for us than what we can do for water. Uh, we are focused more on viewing water as a hazard, particularly in our current climate conversations, than understanding what role we have in living with water and in learning to live with water. Um, and so I feel the, the walks are often a really uh, pivotal way for communities, for individuals to learn from the water itself, how to be more like water and all the ways in which um, water embodies really resilient qualities that we could use in a time of climate change. And so this harkens to the work uh, that many water walkers are doing as protectors of valuing water as life and water having spirit and being alive in its own right. Um, and so they were very keen to say, we're not protesters. I think sometimes because many communities will see indigenous peoples on a street um, or on a road and think that that is some type of protest happening, again, because of the value orientation that many um, Western communities come from, the only time that sort of folks come together in sort of these big congregating spaces are for these sort of public demonstrations of, of protest. Um, and, and for water walkers, it's, it's the complete opposite. So they really wanted folks to know that we're not protesters. Um, this work is nonpartisan. There's, you know, no, uh, polarizing political views ascribed to this work. It's really about how do we be in prayer ceremony? Um, how do we ensure that our traditional teachings around water uh, are continued for future generations? How do we ensure that there is an exchange of knowledge, um, that that knowledge can be passed on across generations? And that oftentimes, even in the digital world we find ourselves today, the best sharing and learning that happens in our society is when we do that in person, when we are actually engaged with the water itself. And so that's a big aspect of, of water walking and why it's important to be with the water. And so as I started to have these conversations with water walkers around the Great Lakes, I really came to an understanding that they were articulating a principles of citizenship, principles of what we might even call water citizenship. Um, if we look at the definition of the word citizenship, it's defined as the qualities that a person is expected to have as a responsible member of a community. And these responsibilities for the water walkers go beyond civic duties of, of voting, et cetera, of stewardship and sort of the, you know, sort of quintessential environmental marketing or greenwashing of reuse, recycle, et cetera. All of those things are needed and are good, not to say that they're not, but it was to try and imagine what it means to be a part of the planet, to be a responsible global citizen beyond national identities and boundaries. What could that look like to reshape our geography to actually be connected to nature. Um, and that's where we sort of came to this conversation and, and, and conceptualization of water citizenship. What they were doing as water walkers was actually about fulfilling that natal connection to be protectors, to be responsible to water, to build their knowledge of water and all of that in constituting that relationality, that connection, that stewardship, that duty of reciprocity. And so I asked the water walkers what they would term good water governance in the larger scheme of how we manage water globally today. What would it look like if we could do better? Um, and they said, uh, you know, overwhelmingly recognize that water has spirit, uh, recognize the personhood of nature, that it should be generational. I might even add intergenerational. Young people should be making decisions alongside elders, alongside um, folks of, of all ages. Um, they also said that we should respect indigenous sovereignty and self-determination, that this work should be collaborative. I was speaking with someone the other day and they, they called it, instead of collective action, collaborative design. We are at a point in our 
human history where we have the opportunity to reimagine what our futures can look like, to reimagine the types of governance that we value and that we implement. And we can do so through a process of collaborative design. And that takes citizen involvement. It takes the recognition of water being a human right. Um, I love this one, which is that grandmothers should be making the laws. Um, and I think that that also speaks to the ways in which aspects of systemic injustice, whether that be racism, ageism, sexism, et cetera, permeate our society and, and hold us back from innovation and from innovative solutions to our climate crisis. So maybe we could have used more grandmothers making the laws. They also said, consider uh, seven generations. They said that we should have more uh, emphasis and respect for indigenous laws, that we need to recognize that water is not a resource, but it is alive, that we can think more sustainably and that we can recognize and uphold our responsibilities to water as kin, um, water being a relation or relative. And so then I asked them, because I got this question a lot, well, what motivates someone to walk thousands of kilometers or miles praying for water around a Great Lake? You know, you have to take time off of work. It takes months to walk along a Great Lake. What would drive someone to want to do that? Um, so I asked the water walkers and they said a lot of times that their motivations came from a call for justice, recognizing that they felt that treatment of water was unjust, um, that they felt that it was a spiritual or spiritual healing call, um, that they felt motivated to protect, conserve, or steward water, that they were working to restore that connection to water, that they felt it was one practice or form through which they could restore that connection that they recognize that water is sacred. And in that sacredness, there was no greater calling than in prayer and ceremony for water. Some articulated that they did wanna bring more awareness to the general public to understand that water is threatened. I think sometimes in the Great Lakes, we live in a level of environmental mythology of the, rake, of the lakes being this renewable, unlimited resource. When in reality, they also are finite and they are um, in need of protection and they are threatened. And there are many ways in which they are um, thriving and, and, and doing very well, but it's something that we have to continue to work hard for. It's not, it's not a given. And so they wanted to bring more awareness to that, the restoration of balance, responsibility-based um, frameworks for protection of water, informed by cultural teachings, educating children, which I'll come back to, a survival of all life, not just humans, and friendship. And I wanna highlight with friendship, it wasn't just the friendship and the camaraderie that they felt among other water walkers, it was actually a restoration of friendship and relationality with the water itself too. Um, and this last, the last one I wanted to come back to on educating children, they really said that, uh, I asked them if they felt that there was any hope for environmental decision makers or politicians right now. So they felt like they could restore uh, their connections to water and, and, and regenerate honorable pathways towards water protection. And they were pretty dismissive of that, that pathway. They, they, they felt like they might be a lost cause in the terms of sort of contemporary politicians and environmental policymakers, but they did say they weren't hopeless. They felt that there was real opportunity in educating children and in within our education system to imbue new, new or sort of reconstitute old ways of valuing water so that we could live in the future in such a manner that respected the inherent rights of water. And I thought that was really hopeful. So it leans into the last portion of our conversation today, which is around justice. It's great to know what constitutes good water governance, but then how do you enforce that? How do you actually make it into a, a realizable uh, form of existence in, in our contemporary society? And so I ask you another question of who is justice for? Oftentimes we position justice within our anthropocentric system 
as something that is solely for the realization of humans, by humans, for humans, etc. But I would ask you to extend your notions of justice to further an understanding of realizing that justice can also be for natural entities and for the water. And there's a new growing movement uh, called Earth Law or Earth Jurisprudence, which actually does just this. It recognizes, honors, and, prote uh, and protects nature's inherent rights to exist, thrive, and evolve. And it envisions a future in which humans and nature flourish together. And we're already seeing this happen around the world. We've seen constitutional amendments, court decisions, local ordinances, and also sort of the reclamation, rematriation, and restitution of indigenous law, which has many of these principles and values already embedded within it. Some of the uh, most popular cases have been, for example, the recognition of the rights of the Whanganui River in Aotearoa in New Zealand um, in 2017. We also note that um, there has been the recognition of the Magpie River uh, recently as well in, in Canada, um, which was a co-governance arrangement, uh, and I'll talk about that in a moment. Um, but other instances across Mexico, Colombia, Uganda, Bolivia, and many, many more than are listed currently on uh, this infographic. And in the context of Indigenous peoples, we all too are advancing Indigenous Earth Law. Um, we have constitutional amendments, uh, we have tribal resolutions like the recognition of the rights of the Klamath River by the Yurok tribe. Uh, we have co-governance arrangements, like I mentioned, for the Magpie River between a local Quebecois municipality and the Innu First Nation. We also have ways in which we are constituting treaties, uh, trying to reimagine geographies to be connected to natural entities themselves. So the Northern Tribes Buffalo Treaty is actually a treaty amongst tribal nations and First Nations um, across the sort of northern border areas or that sort of fictitious border between Canada and the US and follows the protection of the rights of the buffalo. Um, and there are other treaty examples like that that are currently in progress. And sometimes this work also looks to uh, making direct appeals within and through the courts, through amicus briefs and other types of litigation, litigation measures. And it also can be through replicable models. We've seen some really wonderful declarations like water declarations and river declarations and earth declarations that speak to the ways in which we can protect these, these particular aspects of the natural world. And so I just wanna leave you as we transition into questions with the inspiration of the water walkers, recognizing that we all have that needle connection to water. And within us then is that opportunity to be water protectors, to be uh, a force for change, um, where we fully are realizing that water is life and that water itself is alive and should have rights therein protected. So Tabutni, thank you. This is my contact information and I look forward to engaging with you in further conversation around your questions. Thank you so much, Dr. Leonard, um, for your presentation um, and for helping us to think about water um, and to ask the question, like, who is water? And have, um, have us reflect on the definition of citizenship and to extend our definition of justice. Um, you answered some of the questions that were being asked already, but here are a few questions that came up. Um, are there any current policies movements um, that our grandmother approves that for the protection of water that uh, we can support? Oh, that's a really, really great question. Um, I think that there are a lot of initiatives that our grandmother approves and they're actually kind of being grandmother led. So I would just encourage you to sort of look locally. I'm, I'm a strong advocate for many of our most brilliant and brightest climate solutions being locally led and locally driven. And I'm sure that you have grassroots grandmothers in your own backyard that are doing wonderful work. Um, I do highlight the work of um, Dr. Ingrid Waldron on environmental racism. Um, her book, There's Something in the Water, uh, was made into a film in 2019. That also highlights the work of um, Mi'kmaq, uh, indigenous grassroots grandmothers in Nova Scotia who were fighting against the um, Alton uh, gas pipeline expansion. Um, and they just won uh, that this year. Um, Alton has um, decided to not move forward with its um, gas production. 
And so I feel like that's a really strong example of grassroots grandmothers um, being in the thick of a fight for almost a decade and, and winning. Um, and I think a lot of that has to is a testament to the way in which the arts, film, um, the book, There's Something in the Water, the advocacy of the science and environmental uh, studies community can rally around um, local communities initiatives and amplify their voice and, and hopefully have it have a more authentic um, outcome for those communities. Um, so I guess to say that in other terms, I don't know if the voices of the grassroots grandmothers in Nova Scotia would have been as well heard or received, but for the preeminent work of Dr. Ingrid Waldron and drawing attention to the environmental racism in Canada's backyard. Thank you so much for that. Um, another question that came up was, and you kind of mentioned it, um, and there is this kind of concern of how to draw more attention to bring more um, awareness on um, things that are damaging the water. What are some ways that you have seen that have actually um, highlighted um, the damage that's been done? Yes, can you state that one more time? Yeah, sure. Um, so the question was basically of, um, how, are there ways that you have found um, to draw attention to or bring awareness um, to kind of the, I think one of the, the question was um, that highlight fossil fuel in, in infrastructure that is currently damaging the water. Yes, I think the biggest, the biggest highlight is to actually go and visit the water. Um, I talk to so many people who don't actually know where their drinking water comes from. They don't actually even know where the closest surface water body is to where they live. Um, and I think that is a really important first step in getting to know what are some of the damaging effects impacting the water closest to you um, and water more broadly. It's sort of to start local and, and build and ripple out from there. Um, I will say in terms of fossil fuel, we have, you know, existing um, water defense initiatives that are being led right now um, in opposition to line three. So if you are looking to, you know, support water protectors to support those who are on the front lines, um, uh, honor the earth, as well as um, if you type in sort of line three water protectors, you'll find um, their websites and areas where you can donate. Um, water protector legal funds is, you know, always a great place to donate. Um, I say that to then also recognize that in water walking, you walk the entirety of a water body. And I think what's really important about that is you don't just go to the pristine areas. When we think about our beaches, when we think about the areas where we recreate, those areas are curated for our aesthetic value as humans. We never go and visit the areas that are polluted. And in water walking, you don't get to pick and choose. You have to actually go across the entirety of that water. Um, and in doing so, you start to recognize and feel the immense forms of both water health and water illness, uh, for, for lack of, of, of better terminology. And what that means is, you know, for the water walkers, when they are carrying water, they can, they often say that there is a heaviness associated with water when it is not healthy. Um, and that they feel that in carrying that water through um, these maybe toxic or polluted areas. Then um, I think that's a really big learning experience for the broader public to understand that we can't just curate areas of water for our own benefit, but have to recognize the totality and the holistic nature of the, of the entirety of the system and ensure that all of the water is healthy, not just the areas we like to recreate. Thank you so much for that response. And just kind of the reminder that oftentimes when we go to the water, it's, it's not the polluted areas um, mm. that we see. So thank you so much for that. Um, you mentioned uh, some examples of work in protecting water, like the water walkers. Um, are there other movements that you are particularly fond of and finding hope in? Oh, that's a great question. And I think it's, it's a wonderful question in the context of the climate crisis, because climate anxiety is, is real and can be something that is very debilitating for many around the, the planet. 
Um, but I find inspiration in a lot of the work of young people. So the, you know, the youth climate strikes, uh, many of the youth climate activists, I think that their work is wonderful. So anything you can do to support them is very important. Um, and, and Greta Thunberg is, is wonderful, but there are so many, many more diverse youth climate activists that are also working, you know, because the planet is diverse. The planet is, um, is so complex and there are so many different eco regions and, and cultural understandings and knowledges that can inform innovative solutions. So I encourage you, um, if you don't know many youth climate activists to sort of broaden your horizons. Many were on the video earlier today. So I, I think maybe I'm preaching to the choir, but, um, but just learn more. One I love, um, whose work expands outside of just water walking, but is very much a water walker, is Autumn Peltier. She's a wonderful young Anishinaabe Kwe um, water protector. Uh, she's the youngest Anishinaabe Nation water commissioner in, in the history of, of the Anishinaabe Nation. And so I just, I get inspired by young people who, despite all the climate anxiety, still decide to, you know, put their minds and bodies and, and, these younger years of their lives on the line for all of us, right? They could just be teenagers, you know, going to the mall and, you know, enjoying their life. And some of them do that too. But other, most of them are actually, they're at COP26, they're standing outside buildings, they're climate striking, so not, not going to class. So I get really inspired by them. And then on the other side, I'll just, you know, put a, a, a little, um, I guess high five, you know, hands raised for um, Fire Drill Fridays and Jane Fonda and that sort of intergenerational component of how we advance these conversations. Thank you so much for your answers. Um, I think that will bring us to the end of the Q and A. Um, I will hand it over to Katie now. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Kelsey Leonard and. Uh, Amy for the Q&A and for our participants for just adding to this lively and important discussion. I just want to remind uh, those who are watching that they can access the recording to this webinar and our other climate and community series um, on our YouTube page, UMC Justice. And Consider how this series might be a resource for your community and your churches as we continue to educate around environmental and climate justice as we uh, continue to advocate and advance um, initiatives for the water. And then as we continue to be a collective voice for change, we are reminded that our voice is stronger together. So together we're asking that um, those of you who have been participating in this webinar, take action and um, ask the Senate to act now on climate justice. Um, so together we can ensure that policies will foster a better future for the planet and God's or the planet and the people of this planet. Tomorrow's sessions will begin at 10 a.m. Eastern Standard Time with an interactive climate simulation by En-ROADS. The closing session of this series will be a just transition panel um, with a discussion on the equitable and sustainable future. We are so grateful for all who have participated in this series and um, for most especially for the words and the passion, the commitment of Dr. Kelsey Leonard. Thank you for inspiring us, being critical and um, bringing in so many different generations to this uh, work and um, giving us a vision of hope so that we can all be better caretakers of the earth and protect the waters. I hope and pray that our participants continue to be moved and to seek wisdom and strength from the indigenous communities, the water walkers, the mothers who are working to be caretakers of the earth and protect the water. Thank you all.